It was the dawn of a new, greener era. Today is the start of a journey. In 2019, the European Commission began its green revolution to decarbonise Europe. The European Green Deal is our vision for a climate-neutral continent in 2050. But the past five years have seen the Green Deal confronted with a harsh reality. We stay the course, we stay ambitious, and we stick to our growth strategy. The stringent measures demanded by the EU have shaken the status quo in Europe. Now Brussels has to ensure the environment doesn't come at too high a cost for the economy. We will always strive for fair and just transition. That means a fair outcome for future generations to live on a healthy planet with decent jobs and a solemn promise to leave no one behind. From dormant giants in industrial heartlands to invaluable invertebrates in the earth beneath us, the Green Deal aims to put green measures at the heart of Europeans' everyday lives. One solution may be found right under our feet in the soil of Normandy in France. This young startup has developed a cheap solution to give farmers a head start in going green. Here we're loading the horse manure that we've collected from stables in the region. We'll use it to feed the earthworms. Horse manure isn't the only ingredient in Veer Agro's unique recipe. We're mixing coffee grounds and grain residues from breweries. This production line is 25 metres long and the main activity takes place out of sight. The workers get through hundreds of tonnes of waste each year. And here are our earthworms. Here at Veragro, we have 25 million employees, 25 million earthworms. They work seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Their job is to consume this organic waste and to produce vermicompost, which is the best fertiliser that exists. We haven't invented anything, we're just copying what nature does best. Producing worm fertiliser on this scale is unique in Europe. Veragro received €560,000 from the EU, of which a third came from cohesion funds, to help it nourish its worms and the earth. It's 100% earthworm excretion. Using this substance, just like this, on an agroeconomic level, there's nothing better. We aim to concentrate everything that's in it, all the life, all the microorganisms, all the main active ingredients, into a liquid format that can be used for agriculture. The finished product is the fruit of three years of research. Last year, 600,000 litres were produced here. Here is the end product. Here is our biostimulant. If we look at the average of our field studies on potatoes, this increases yield by 15%. It has a valuable effect in conditions of abiotic stress, such as during periods of drought. As part of the Green Deal, the EU's soil strategy aims to improve soil quality by pushing farmers to use less chemical pesticides and fertilisers, and perhaps let the earthworms do their job. We start with a waste product, and we end up with a product that helps farmers use less fertiliser. So it's a virtuous circle. It's a circular economy. At the other end of Europe in Estonia, it's Europe's city dwellers who are set to benefit from the European Green Deal. These apartment blocks date back to the Soviet era, and many haven't received much renovation since then. So this is the terrace, and you can see it's falling off. Like, you can see also the windows are really, like, old. Like, this is an old window. Expenses of heating are, like, high, and Estonia is a cold country, so it's, like, a bit hard to kind of live here. Poor insulation in winter, inefficient ventilation in summer, all leading to high energy costs for residents. Each block is home to 120 people, and across the country, thousands live in similar conditions. In Tallinn, we have uh, over 1,000 buildings like these behind me, or similar, and we are doing the piloting and testing for all these houses, because we will have to turn the new page, because, or, OK, these houses have lasted for 50 years, but they will not last another 50 years without doing something. We will have to turn the page in the renovation wave uh, as well, so the houses uh, represent the nowadays in Estonia. The programme to renovate these four apartment buildings is set to cost €6 million, Euros, with €5 million coming from the EU's Regional Development Fund and the European Urban Initiative.
It's a national strategy to move towards uh, zero emissions. Everybody will have to do their part. There's no such thing as state's goals. Everybody has their parts in it, local governments, and finally, everybody who's living in these houses. The solution is just over the road. This pilot project showcasing 60 centimetre thick prefabricated insulation and ventilation cladding, which is fixed like Lego across the exterior, helping reduce heat loss by up to 70%. And this is not only a Estonian problem, it's, it's, it's a challenge for all, whole Europe. After the Second World War, it was a real challenge to reconstruct building stock that was demolished in the, in the war. And now the same challenge is to make this building stock decarbonized. Solutions like this are needed across the EU to meet the goal of climate neutrality by 2050. Three quarters of buildings in Europe were built before 1990 and need to be upgraded to be energy efficient. Tallinn wants to be a model. It aims to reduce carbon emissions by 40% by 2030. As part of the new European Bauhaus, the Green Deal's urban pillar, this communal urban garden, one of 33 in Tallinn, will allow local residents to grow their own food. It's alongside the route for a 13-kilometre-long pollinator highway built on disused land linking central Tallinn to the Green Belt. When this kind of former industrial or brownfield area opens up, uh, the city has a choice how to develop it. And I think that by choosing to create a park, uh, a linear park, uh, the city will contribute uh, into, into creating a better habitat for people. Despite its green ambitions, Estonia still relies on oil shale for half of its electricity, one of the dirtiest power sources on Earth. The overall sector represented 22,000 jobs at its peak. Tallinn, though, has vowed to phase out oil shale by 2035. To compensate, Estonia will receive 354 million euros from the EU's Just Transition Fund that aims to support the decarbonisation of Europe. The Neo Factory is one beneficiary. It will produce magnets for electric vehicles. The plant will create a thousand jobs. The firm received an 18 million euro grant from the JTF. Customers are asking businesses like ours to establish supply chains in Europe as fast as possible and as big as possible. Um, but in order to do that, uh, in the time frame required, there, you need to support the economics with these grants. Regions like this are a typical example of the challenges facing heavy industry in Europe. For European Commissioner Elisa Ferreira, the EU has a responsibility to provide solutions as it pushes ahead with its green goals. It is important that we very quickly present to workers, present to people, to citizens, a prospect that immediately solves their problems. I think it's important that we keep this time frame and that we do everything possible with a lot of energy within this time frame because it is an opportunity. But for many Estonians, like many Europeans, the fear is that the green transition is making the cost of living more expensive. 70% of Estonians say that inequalities must be addressed at the same time as climate neutral policies. Estonia created a new Ministry of Climate last year. Kristin Mikal's task is to convince voters that Tallinn's objective for 100% renewables is realistic and desirable. I usually ask the question that uh... Does your voters have the solar panels on their houses? Usually do. They are not fighting against this kind of renewable energy. Uh, do your voters uh, like, let's say, cheaper energy compared to much expensive energy which comes from the fossil? The answer is probably yes. So these are all very practical things. You like cheaper energy, uh, you like new jobs, you like more added value. These are very economical questions to moder modern productions. Europe's race to be green, though, has to overcome doubts in places like Chemnitz in eastern Germany. German car makers have had factories here for almost a century, but that's now the past. The EU wants to phase out combustion engines by 2035. At this gathering of European regions dependent on the automobile sector, the message is clear. Yes to the phase out, as long as the EU foots part of the bill. In Saxony, in Saxony, we are already in the process of converting the economy and the automotive industry to electromobility, and there will of course be upheavals. There will be one or two companies that will have major problems, but there are also huge opportunities, and we just have to take advantage of these opportunities. And for this, we also need government help.
Europe's car sector employs 13 million people across the EU and contributes 7% of the EU's GDP. Last year, the car lobby succeeded in watering down EU emissions targets amid concerns that tight regulations hand an advantage to Chinese and US competitors. The European automobile manufacturer's manifesto calls for the tools to remain competitive, including a just transition plan specifically for the industrial sector. So with regards to the Green Deal, uh, our industry is asking for a complementary industrial deal that also understands the logic of the European automobile value chain and with that um, equally looks into uh, decarbonizing uh, Europe but also making sure that Europe remains to be a strong industrial player globally. Are we saying we should copy uh, what the US or China is doing? We don't do that, but rather look into the strength of Europe and try to develop that so that we can remain competitive also in the future. While Europe is aiming for a greener future, it's also trying to reverse the impact of generations of heavy industry. Poland is on the front line of that revolution. Three of the ten highest polluting power plants in the EU are Polish. The EU's Just Transition Fund is providing 3.85 billion euros to accompany the end of coal in six regions in the country. This coal-fueled plant in Konin once provided 10% of Poland's electricity. This unit uses about 7,000 tonnes of coal each day, depending on the load. The coal plant is due to close at the end of 2025, with plans for a nuclear power plant to be built on the site within a decade. We see what the global trends are. Renewable energy is the dominant trend now. So unfortunately, this lignite-based energy industry must be phased out and this change must take place. Coal use in Poland is at an all-time low, but still supplies 61% of the country's energy needs. A few kilometers away, this new plant is part of the alternative. This is the storage facility for the biomass, which comes from wood chip. Locally sourced biomass is burned, and the goal is to produce green hydrogen, a cleaner alternative to coal. This energy transformation process needs to have a positive impact. Its aim is to create a modern, environmentally friendly energy industry, producing electricity and heat energy, but in the context of zero emission production. Replacing coal here has forced the operator ZPAC to turn to biomass, hydrogen, solar and wind farms to compensate, as well as eventually the nuclear plant. This plant's first hydrogen electrolyzer will receive three and a half million euros from the EU. It's amazing. If we look at it overall, without losing any properties, we'll produce the same amount of electricity and the same amount of heat energy but we're not causing climate destruction. The green transition, though, is a source of enormous upheaval in the region. Open-cast lignite coal mines have provided thousands of well-paid jobs for generations of workers. This is the Dolores Excavator, a now dormant giant that once chewed up the landscape of central Poland. Everyone thought coal would be mined here until the end of the world and a day longer, but unfortunately, it's not what happened. Alicia Messerschmitt is a trade union leader who was forced to embrace the change. She helped negotiate a secure future and an equivalent salary for the thousands of mine workers, a reskilling plan funded with 45 million euros from the EU. We have nine partners who will guide these people through this difficult period as they look for jobs with a new employer or retrain or start their own businesses. We're offering security for these 2,200 people. None of them will be left without any help. Here in eastern Wielkopolska, the region received 415 million euros from the Just Transition Fund. For the past five years, Maciej Sitek has headed a task force to ensure that the mine closure didn't lead to an economic catastrophe. The most important goal for the next 10 years is to create a new identity for the region. I am proud of the fact that I live in a place where the region will get something more, that has modern technologies. We expect to get a nuclear power plant. 
and that we will create a market for small and medium-sized businesses, and people will want to be here. Regions like this are a vital demonstration of the EU's value, imposing strict environmental regulations and providing concrete solutions. For local social activist Agata Kuzminska, failure to act here would provoke yet more resentment directed towards Brussels. For the first time, I had the impression that EU funds for development were directed towards us and that we were the intended beneficiaries and that it wasn't just a source of financing for the construction of new roads, new bridges, renovations or infrastructure. It was the first time that they seemed to realize that the answers must be delivered to people, that there has to be a social dimension in this process. Krzysztof Lewandowski is one example of that fair solution. He was part of the team of operators on the Dolores excavator. But after a decade working in the mine, his well-paid job was scrapped. Despite the upheaval, he has few regrets. If I could turn back time, if I had the choice of either continuing to sit in the mine, stuck in this relic of the past, or being given the chance to start a new life, well, in my opinion, this is a better life. In all, the EU helped fund the reskilling of 5,500 workers from the lignite industry. Now Christoph works as a solar panel installer, a job with a future. We saw what was happening. The world is moving forward. But this green energy, we know it will always be there. Coal is an outdated heating source. There wasn't any sadness when they closed. There wasn't any disappointment. Things had to change. With solar panels on many roofs, renewables represent 27% of Poland's power generation. From homes to factories, farms to mines, the Green Deal has already left a mark on Europe. The EU still, though, wants renewable power to reach 42.5% by 2030.